All right, so in part three, we're going to take a look at how we control water using levees, channels, and dams. In some parts of the country here, or parts of the world, you will see a levee, which is just a big mound, basically, or a wall built to hold back water that might be in a river or a creek. So the mighty Mississippi River, um, you know, New Orleans is, a, is very low, and parts of New Orleans City are actually below sea level. So you have these big levees or dikes to prevent the water from the river from flooding the town. That's a pretty kind of precarious place to be living because the only thing that's keeping you and your house from getting flooded is this wall or this levee that could break. And so um, that happens sometimes. And um, you can kind of summarize some of these points here. You can pause it if you'd like. Uh, I want to point out, though, that when we make efforts to control flooding, we are preventing a natural thing from occurring, which is flooding is meant to happen. It helps bring in new nutrients, habitats. Um, they, in many ways, they rely on it. We also make channels. So we take a river or waterway and we, make it, um, we pave it with concrete. And this increases the rate of flow of water, preventing it from backing up and flooding. However, the use of concrete prevents water infiltration to recharge aquifers. It also reduces riparian vegetation, which provides habitat for birds and bugs and shade for water creatures, keeping water temperature cool. So um, that means that the water ends up getting too hot. And of course, dams. This is Hoover Dam built in 1936 along the Colorado River near Las Vegas, one of many dams along the Colorado River. And we build dams to prevent floods, to generate electricity, like we do at Hoover Dam, to provide drinking water and to provide irrigation water. And so far, 45,000 dams over 15 meters or 50 feet high have been built in the world. So big effect on the hydrologic cycle. Few major rivers today are not dammed. And the Colorado River is one clear example. If you take a look at, this is the flow rate at the mouth of the Colorado River where it actually empties into uh, into the ocean. Back in the early 1900s it was you know pretty high but nowadays sometimes it's just a mere trickle. Some years it doesn't even flow all the way to the ocean. Kind of sad in a way because along the way you have several dams. Here's a dam which creates Lake Powell. Here's another dam, Hoover Dam, to create Lake Mead, Lake Mojave, Lake Havasu, and then these other two dams down here. And if you look at a lot of this, um, this area around here, this is irrigation. This is land where we're growing food using water from the Colorado River. And the benefits and costs of dams, all right, so that's a pretty extensive list here. Um, but people do get displaced when you build a dam because you are flooding where they used to live. And you do capture sediment, which is a big thing, where over time it's just going to back up and back up and back up. And this is sediment that should have gone to the ocean to help replenish um, shorelines. And um, you actually have to physically go in and drag or, or dredge out the sediment with big bulldozers. It's a um, big deal. Of course, the dam could break. That would be catastrophic. And um, you have, uh, what are some other big ones? You have reduced downstream flow and disruption of the flooding. We'll talk about more about that in a moment, but that affects fish, of course. And um, you know, on the plus side, with dams, you do get irrigation water. You can make electricity as they go through here. They turn um, turn generators to make the electricity. You do have you know the, the control of flood. So if you get a big storm, you can keep that storm from rushing down too quickly as it gets stopped by the dam. And um, and of course you have new recreational activities or opportunities up, upstream, but downstream you may have the loss of recreational activities. Pretty hard to kayak down a river that's been dammed. And this is just kind of a list of some basic ones here. You can um, you know, take a look, record some, make sure you're familiar with them. And um, let's talk about rivers, though, as far as the natural flow of things. Wild, ri wild rivers have natural cycles of seasonal variation, where it's drier in the summer and fall and heavier during turbulent loads. Um, sorry, drier in the summer and the fall with, um, with heavy turbulent loads of sediment and nutrients in the winter. In other words, you get your big storms in the winter, that brings sediment brings nutrients and a continued gradual discharge through spring. However, when you put a dam up, dams are built precisely to prevent the natural function of rivers. So in the, in the summer is when you are using your heaviest, um, heaviest flow of water in the summer because you're using that flow of water to create electricity, to power 
air conditioners and all the other things for all the other reasons why we use more energy in the um, in the summertime. And um, and then you are getting blockage and control in the winter. So, um, in other words, in the winter when nature is used to it flowing fast, we've actually we're blocking it to store that water for summertime, and that really messes with the natural habitat. Um, Okay, and Three Gorges Dam, you should familiar, be familiar with this. This is the largest dam in the world across the Yangtze River in China. It was completed in 2003. Over one million people were displaced to build it. Farmland, archaeology, and habitat were all submerged. Um, and the critics worry about the sedimentation buildup in the reservoir and the water quality. There's actually places where the sediment is so great you can actually walk on top of it. And um, it's kind of like this thick kind of, I don't know what you call it, it's like, almost like thick clay-like. And, um, okay, so dam removal, some small dams are being removed, and this is great. Some of them are, are not renewing their licenses. So dam removal basically takes care of all those things we talked about. It restores riparian ecosystems. It lets the water flow as it should, which allows the vegetation to be what it should. And it restores fisheries. It reintroduces recreation, such as rafting and fly fishing. And, um, I guess one thing that we didn't specifically mention or talk about here was how the um, how the fish migrations are impeded, and they cannot get through the dams. But maybe you can build some kind of fish ladders to help them um, get upstream to to lay their eggs. All right, let's go back to where we were. So water wars, our last topic here under freshwater uses. Just to give you one example of freshwater depletion. Aral Sea in Central Asia. It was the fourth largest freshwater body on Earth, but it could disappear completely. In 1960, this was its size. In 1999, in 2002, getting smaller and smaller with the passing years. Why? Because they were pulling the water out to irrigate for growing cotton. And um, you can see here a satellite view of it. We, um, this is where there used to be former water. This is where it's very shallow, very deep. And you can actually see some cases where the, um, the water left so quickly, fell so quickly that boats were just um, stranded. They just, you know, ended up being on dry land. A statement here by the chairman of the World Water Commission. The wars of the 21st century will be fought over water, not oil, as we see so commonly today. Already scarcity has caused or exacerbated conflict in arid areas such as the Colorado River states in southwest U.S. being um, somewhat contentious as to who has the rights to that water. If the Colorado River is starting off in Colorado, can Colorado choose to take most of that water for its irrigation, um, leaving none for the other states, or do they have to work out some kind of an agreement? And what if they can't agree? Then what? Who owns the water? That's kind of a, a big question here. It is one of those things, the, uh, it's a commons, right? And so if we don't manage it, it can lead to a tragedy. All right, so that's the end of our discussion about 7.1 uh, freshwater resources. Please check out this video 7.2 on freshwater pollution.